He came here recently, so I talked to him. I hadn't seen him since maybe like 04, maybe. You know what I mean? Because he had got transferred from Toledo when I was there. I can't remember where he went to, but he went to a different prison. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's an affidavit of uh, like Mike Williams. Robert Williams. Robert Williams, yeah. Like he's out in Conneaut somewhere. Do you know him? You say he is where? He's like in a prison out in Northeast Ohio. Grafton maybe or something, I think that's. Yeah, I think it's like Conneaut, which is in the far I've never even heard of that. Yeah. <laughs> um. I met him in prison. I never knew him, and he knew a whole lot about me. He said, I know who you is. Because of Travis. It was crazy. You know, people run around like in here, you might, everybody don't go to the commissary that often, so you might have an item that's from commissary that costs a certain amount of money, and you might be like, somebody trade me this and this item for a bag of coffee or whatever. Mm -hmm. I had a bag of chips. And I was running around, you know, and then in there we had to lock down at like nine o'clock at night in a cell. So when they tell you, get ready, like you got five, 10 minutes, you gotta get ice and go to the microwave and do whatever you gonna do before you go to your cell. So I had a bag of chips and I was like, hey man, who got whatever flavor I was looking for is I wanted a different kind. And he slept on the second tier across from me. And so he was like, he was like, I got that, I'll do that for you. And when he told me that, I said, you know, they tell me you get to your cell. So I'm like, man, good looking. I said, man, I said, man, you, uh, I've been peeping you. I said, man, I think you, you seem like a cool dude, man. You know what I'm saying? I said, man, and while I was saying that, and I'm about to introduce myself to him, as he had just came, he probably been there a few days. And then I was like, I said, man, what's your name? And he told me. And before I got ready to tell him my name, I swear, it's, it's like this something out of the movie. He said, calm and cool. He said, I know exactly who you is. He was blinking slow like that. He said, man, Travis told me all about you. He said, he told me y'all didn't do that or nothing. And I look, cause I'm backpedaling to myself cause they like, get, get in your cell. And I said, hey man, I, I, I'm gonna want to talk to you. He said, we gonna talk, we gonna holler. And like for the longest, he, like after he said that, he closed his door and went and got on his bed or whatever. For the longest, I went to my room and just stayed in the door. I just stared out the window towards his cell on the other side of the tier for a long time. Like I just was. Which prison was that? Toledo. It was Toledo. Yeah. I think he he came there. I met him. That was like in 05 or 06. Mm. Was that rolling at all? Yep, it was rolling. So you guess you just got a story. No, yeah, that's good. You ready? Yep, we're rolling. <laughs> yeah, he's not even he's not even from Ohio. He's from Michigan. Yeah. And I don't think he had ever been locked up in Ohio before. So. Huh. And he told me that his cellmate when he was in Lebanon and Travis was together. You know what I mean? So they used to be in the cell, and he come back from working in the kitchen or whatever. And he say, man, we used to all sit around, like one of us would be, cause you know the toilet in the room, wanna be on the toilet. Somebody else is sitting on the locker box, somebody sitting on the bed. He was like, we just, you know, used to talk about stuff and get to know each other. And we like, so where are you from? Where you catch your case at and how you go about, you know what I mean, whatever. And he said, man, he told me all about you. He said, man, he told me y'all was like brothers and that he feels sorry for what he did and all that. And I'm like, now I could still to this day, just even thinking back about that, like it take you, I don't know how to explain it, man. I guess you say like an out of body experience or something, but it don't, it don't seem real. You know what I mean? Like I say, when he told me that, I had to back up to myself and I'm just staring out the door like, like I didn't just lost myself. Like I'm looking for myself. Like it was deep, man. How long have you been here? For 10 years. 10 years, and before that you are at Toledo Correctional. I did eight years there, and then I did uh, like 13 or 14 months in Lebanon. Did like two or three months in um, CRC and reception. 
And I spent like seven months in the county jail, Lucas County Jail. Right. So Wayne, you're here because you were convicted of killing Maurice. Right. Did you kill Maurice? Absolutely not. What's, what's you can't ask him if you killed him. Can't yeah. say it like that. So why should why should I believe you? Well, I'm pretty sure you know. I was told that you had time to get a little access to some of the files and paperwork, and even to myself, anybody else that's came across this case in itself, none of it makes any sense, and there's a reason why, and that reason is because. None of that is the truth. And things that are coming to light that I'm even finding out these days myself is mind blowing to me, you know what I mean? Right. Such as what? Such as them affidavits, have you been able to read it? Well, you spoke on the one of Robert Williams. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, and I never met him a day before in my life. And he told me, I know who you are and I know you don't belong here. And you know, I was told that you don't belong here, and you know what I mean? You're innocent, so. Tell me about your relationship with Travis. Man, that's, that's a long time ago. But I, you know, I remember it like yesterday, man. Oh man, that's, that's deep. I smile, you know what I mean? It might seem crazy to you when I think back, but I wish no ill will towards him, and Man, we was like brothers, man, you know what I mean? And I, and I loved him, man, like my brother. I met him at this church, you know what I mean, on um, Oakwood and Hoy. I don't know if you're familiar with that area, Grace Presbyterian Church. And the reverend, he knew a lot of us from the neighborhood over there. And he used to allow us to come to the church because we would be, you know, out and about at the time where we supposed to be in school or we should be doing more productive things and we it's a lot of opportunities for us to get in trouble so he used to allow us even though you know we'd be skipping school or whatever you could come to the church you know we'd go there and we play basketball in the gym how old were you guys at that point when you met him when i met him i was i think 18 I think I was 18 going on 19, but I, or I might have been 19 already. Right. So what was your life like in Toledo before, you know, you were charged with this? Were you ever Man. in trouble? I mean, were yeah, you, yeah. What did you get in trouble for doing? Just, like I said, like things like, uh, what's it called, like safety school ordinance or whatever, when you're supposed to be at school, you uh truant or whatever. So and they catch serious. you. No, no, I'm saying that's just one thing. So, I mean, you know, I was involved in a lot of things. Like, I'm gonna just be honest with you because, you know, I mean, that's the whole point of this. Like, drugs and, and, and street life and, you know, everything that comes with street life, you know, I could write a book on it. I was raised my whole life around it. When you come from where I come from, it's not, you know what I mean? A lot of it's a lot of it's a lot of love between people. You know what I mean? But when that crack and stuff came, it messed a whole lot of families up, including my own. You know what I mean? Was there violence? I mean, from you personally on the street? From me, I mean, when you coming up where we came from, it was like you never had nothing. You know what I'm saying? As far as material things and, and worldly possessions like that. So we was always bred up on living by principle, like your man, your name meaning something, your name being solid. You know what I mean? Having a legacy, like not saying as far as violence or anything, but what I mean to say about that is when I was coming up and you know, you get into arguments or whatever when you was in elementary grade school we was taught like stand up for yourself or whatever. So as far as that, like me and my peers, we fought each other and made up. You know, it was like family in the neighborhood. So like everybody that I knew that lived in my neighborhood lived there all their life for generations. From the children to adults to grandparents, they might've lived there 50 years or so, you know what I mean? So 
my grandmother, friends with their grandma ac across the street, down the street. My mother and father went to school with their uncles and aunties, you know what I mean? And I went to school with their children, so we all knew each other all their life. Like, even in my community, the police officers in my community is from the community, too. Even my own uncle was a Toledo police officer. Mm -hmm. He just retired uh, recently. What was his name? Lon Woodard. Hmm. Did you know? He did, like, excuse me, not to cut you off, but he worked, like, 35 years, I think, something like that. Hmm. Did you know Maurice? I never met him. Never met him a day in your life? Never. Where were you on the night of June 15th? I was at home with my, with my girlfriend who was pregnant at the time, Ursula Belez. Hmm. Now, you did not testify at trial. Why not? So... I mean, obviously, you see, I'm here based on little. So I was told and advised then at that time that it's best to just not speak on things, even from my perspective, to help myself because all of that can be turned around and used as a tool to try to, you know what I mean, contradict what I say. And the whole time they say, Okay, well, they have no evidence and no case and no witnesses and no motive. And this whole case hinges on the person who admitted to doing it in the first place. And the burden of proof is on the state. And we gonna allow them basically to uh, trip their self up, which that's what happened. He told a lot of stories and they was pointed out to be lies, and then he admitted to lying numerous times. Right. Why would Travis do that? You said you guys were like brothers. Why would he drag you into it? So he wrote me, and he told me that he was jealous of the bond between me and Carl, and that he feel like I owe him something. You know what I mean? And he, I decided to write him one day. So I was in prison maybe two or three years, and one day I said, man, if, I, if I'm going to be here, I'm going to write this man and I'm going to ask him, man, why? After everything I've done for you, why would you put me here? You know what I mean? And I was told, like, you read some of those letters, so I know you can see, like, it's not, he's not faking when he talked to me. He talking to me from a place that's endearing. He's saying, man, we was, we was like this, man. I don't know how we got to where we at. You know what I mean? When was the last time you talked to him? Uh, I, maybe when I first came here, that was 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he signed an affidavit in 2002 saying that you guys had nothing to do with this. Right, and he wrote me in letters. He said, man, I apologize, I'm sorry, because what I did at that time was, when he wrote me, it's one thing, for me to say how I feel. It's another thing when I know I done been out here with you, you done slept at my home, around my children, my mother, you know what I'm saying? I know your brothers, I met your mother before, even some of his brothers done been in prison with me. And they say, man, we don't understand, you know what I mean, how or why he would do that. Like, we don't even know who he is no more. I don't feel like I know him, like, I don't, I don't understand him, you know what I mean? So his story was that you guys spent the day together, he was having trouble with Maurice, he wanted you guys to rough him up and lay him out, and then you just stumble across him, pass the gun around. What's, what's the most unbelievable thing about that story? Everything in its entirety, because for one, if you saying that this is about money that's owed to you, about a person that you know, what does that have to do with me? You know what I mean? When I met Travis, he was sleeping on the street. His mother, like I said, the church was for people who needed a meal, who needed shelter, things like that. And the Reverend would provide that for us in the neighborhood. So when I met him, I didn't know him. 
and he asked me, could he smoke some marijuana with me and my homeboy? So we sitting in the car. I'm sitting just like I'm sitting talking to you. My homeboy had a lot of uh, music in his car. So, you know, the bass and stuff will make the mirrors vibrate. And I'll never forget, this is the first time he ever talked to me. I remember it like it happened five minutes ago. I'm sitting in the car and the mirrors is moving and then I see somebody walk un walking up towards the car. And I'm like, hold on, man, hold on. And then I say, man, who, who is this? So my homeboy see who it is and he like, man, he start cussing him out. Man, get away from my car, man, get, man, go somewhere. Right, so I'm in, the, I'm in the car with my homeboy Talvin, and we sitting behind the church, because you know, we respect the reverend. He know we be doing a lot of stuff, but we not gonna sit there and do it right in his face. We smoking marijuana in the car, we not gonna be. So we parked over on the next street, which is behind the parking lot to where the church is at. It's not the front street right there where the church is at. So when he approached, I'm looking at him, and you know, I'm out here and I'm, like I say, been introduced to street culture and I know that, you know, people rob, steal, whatever. So I'm making sure, you know, I'm asking him, man, who is this dude? Making sure that he's not trying to rob me or anything like that. I saw him a few times before hanging around the church, but I never spoke to him. So now I'm looking at him in the mirror and my homeboy rolled the window down and say, hey man, get, get away from my car. So he said my name and I'm looking at him like, Man, I know you. And he said, no, nah. he looked down like, one thing about him is he was always real shy, you know what I mean? He wouldn't look you in the face like this when he talked to you. And not only was I like, I say he was like my brother, I was like a big brother or uncle or father figure to him. So when I got to know him, I would get on him about stuff like that. Like, man, speak up, man, you, you with me, man, represent yourself. You know what I mean? Because like I said, where I came from, and you don't have a lot. Your image and your name is everything. When somebody say your name and say Brian Duggar, and the dude say, hey, I know him, stand up guy. Then there's no questions about that afterwards. Right. You know what I mean? So did you spend the day with him on June 15th at all? No. You weren't with him at all the day of June 15th? The last time that I was with him and I saw him, he came to my relative's house and he he came to Carl's mother's house. And I happened to come from up the street because all our family live, you know, up and down the street from each other. So I came, I approached, walking up to the house, and I see Carl on the porch, and he like, he looking at me and doing like this, so I'm like, man, what's, what's going on? I'm laughing because I'm thinking that he playing. You know, this is my homeboy, I knew him all my life, he my family. So we mess with each other from time to time. I'm like, man, what, what is you doing, man? You know what I mean? So he say, he say, hey, man, dude, man, he, he, he over here or whatever. Because we had an altercation with him before right. about him stealing his stuff from us. And like I said, he didn't have nothing. So at this time, when I met him, you know what I mean, and I would give him money, whenever he was with me, I took care of him. But I told him, like, man, you're supposed to be a man. You got to stand on your own and represent yourself as well as me. When you with me or you known for being with me, you represent us. So what you're going to do is get you a job. And I took him to this woman named Barbara Hutton that I know that uh, she helped a lot of people that was uh, parolees from off of uh, DYS or whatever, juvenile, get jobs. And they had this... this uh, company called Morrison Associates. Mm -hmm. And what they would do was, I don't know how they had it linked up to where, with the parole authority, they already had it to where they got people jobs. Morrison Associates, I don't know if you would call it like a temp service or what you call that, but they, they already connected with companies that's looking for people to hire, but they helping people that's <laughs> parolees. So I talked to her because I worked with them before. I was on parole before from DYS, and in the process of me getting him a job, she convinced me to work too. So, you know, I always been good with my hands, so I worked a construction job with, um, I don't know the name of the company, I just know 
the name of the dude, I don't even know his last name, I don't remember, but his name was Sam. He was an Arab dude and he had his own construction company and we used to remodel houses. So what were your thoughts when you got arrested and they said, you know, we think you were one of the gunmen here? Well, for a long time, they wasn't telling me what was going on. I didn't have no idea why they even had me, so what's going through my mind is just a slight sense of bewilderment, just, you know, un unknowing, just curiosity. Be but it's not something that was not for, for unfamiliar to me because being in the inner city, I done been picked up by police plenty of times just for being out, you know what I mean? Like I say, and then some of them know me, but the ones from the community, you know, I know them personally. So when it comes to the detectives, I don't know them. When they come, it's a whole different feeling because you don't know how that could turn out, you know what I mean? And thankfully, I'm still here because there's been some times that some detectives done hopped out on me and, you know, they didn't threaten to blow me away. And that's, man, that's, that's just, man, I don't know how to describe that feeling. Yeah. So what were your thoughts when you were sitting in the, the courtroom and you heard Travis telling this story by your account, which is a uh, fantasy, isn't true at all. What were your thoughts sitting there listening to him? I just kept shaking my head. And it was like something that, it was like, if I could describe it best, it was like, you know, if you ever had like a ringing in your ear and it take a while to go away, hearing him talk was like, it was like just a ringing in my ear. And I was like, man, it's, it's just, it's disturbing me. Like, what is, what is this? And none of it seemed like it's, it's really happening. You know what I mean? It's, it's like a, I don't know what's the word for it. You know what I mean? Were you angry with him when he was up there in the stand or were you just confused? I wasn't confused because at this point in time, you know, I've been able to look over this, my discovery packet, speak to lawyers, see what different statements was to detectives and officers. And, you know, at this time, by that time, he already had, uh, took his plea bargain, so I was able to read over all of that stuff. So it was just, uh, man, it was just, it was just pain, man. You know what I mean? Like, it was, it was pain. Right. That stuff hurt my heart. You know what I mean? I couldn't figure out why at that time. But this is from somebody who I told, man, I love you, man. You, you my brother. And he told me the same. But upon my last encounters with him, I told him me and him could, could no longer hang out like that no more. Because leading up to that point, you know, which made me have him go get a job was he kept stealing from me. And I said, man, listen, man, anything you want and I got it, I give it to you. I was raised like that. Carl was raised like that. If somebody gave me a dollar when I was five or six years old, old enough to go to the corner store by myself, if I went and one of my cousins or whoever went with me, I spent that dollar with them. Man, give me a quarter bag of Cheetos and a quarter of juice and give him 50 cent or whatever he want. You want some lemon heads or non or whatever, get that. So, so what was your thought when the prosecution put on Travis? And the coroner, detective, maybe a forensics expert, and that's it. I'm just like, man, this, it was like, to tell you the honest truth, man, it's like, even still to this day, it's kind of a different chapter of it. You know what I mean? So it's, it's still the same version. It's just different chapters of it. I feel trapped in a bubble. It's like I'm in the matrix and I can't escape. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like I done jumped in the pool and I'm in the shallow end and I'm holding my breath. And all I gotta do is stand up, but it's like my legs don't work. You know what I mean? I'm just trapped. 
Now, the jury deliberated for 26 hours, and at some point they came back in the courtroom and said we're kind of deadlocked. And at that point, they were taking you back to your jail cell, and you kind of lost it, to be honest. You got upset. Um, what happened there? Well, it was a lot of tension between the court staff people and our family members. So I don't know if you ever was able to look at any of that footage or whatever, but they was, you know what I mean, disrespecting some of them and talking to them crazy. Like my, even my grandfather is an elderly man, you know what I mean? And they saying different stuff to him and, you know, we aware of all that. So it's just like a whole lot of tension, you know what I mean? Like it was already a lot of, you know, I wouldn't say quite say pressure, but just a, a certain level of energy in the air where, you know, this is not something that's, um, it wasn't something pleasant, you know what I mean? It wasn't a pleasant feeling for anybody. Right. So, you know, you people had that edge already, and then they was having disagreements with them. And even the jury itself, like, you know, like you, you mentioned, when they asked, could they, and it was after 18 hours, if I remember correctly, they asked, you know, if they could go home, because they said, we cannot come together and reach unanimous decision. And they was told, no, I'm not accepting that. And until you do go and do as you were, you know, or uh, you were. Uh, reach an agreement, right. Yeah, hire, I mean, not hire, what is it? Unanimously? No, I'm saying they wasn't hired, but they was um, recruited, as you was recruited to do and fulfill your duties, okay. you won't be allowed to go home. Right. And you can't have lunch, coffee, cigarettes, any of that. Only place you go in is to the bathroom, escorted by the court deputies, right. and back to that room. So eight hours straight, they went back into that room. Yeah, and they came back 26 hours. Do you remember that moment, even though it was 20 years ago? Do you remember that moment? Exactly, I'll never forget so, it. Tell me what you remember about it. So I was in a holding cell. They had me in one side, you know, and I was fenced in or whatever. And it was like another cage or whatever that they had Carl in. So he was pacing back and forth and he had his Bible out and he was reading his Bible and he was talking to me. He was, he was upset though and he was trying to calm himself down and we trying to be that, um, just be that, that, you know, that calm voice in each other's mind. Like, man, listen, man, we gonna be all right, man. This ain't gonna be, you know, this is not, this is not right. We know this ain't the truth and the, and the truth will come out. So that's all we gotta focus on, you know what I mean? And- So then they take you into the courtroom. No, they, before that, they came back and said, they reached the verdict. Okay. So when they said that, you know, in our minds is, we finna be leaving up out of here. You know what I mean? And So when you're walking back to the courtroom, you thought this is it, we're, they're gonna let us go. Exactly. So tell me about that walk. I, mean, you're I had no doubt in my mind. I, this is my second time being in, in the Lucas County Jail for the same offense. I was innocent the first time, I'm still innocent, so. You mean the first time and then they took it to the grand jury and they gave it like a no bill. They didn't bring charges and then they put you back in jail for. Right. Okay. So walking in there, then you hear the, uh, you know, the jury, them read the thing and they said essentially guilty on all charges. What, what went through your mind? Man, it was like, it was like my spirit fainted away or away from or inside my body. You know what I mean? Like I was standing there, but it was just like my, my spirit just, just <sighs> And at that time it was like, it was like a silence around me. Like, you know what I mean? Like a, I guess they call it like a calm before a storm because I'm like, man, what's, what's to happen next? Hold on. And at the same time, this, this ain't real. You telling me, they said, guilty, I'm still trying to 
instilled that in my mind, like they said that, that no, they couldn't have. And all while this is going on, my family has been going back and forth with the court staff. So now they uh, making people leave and stuff. They had kicked a few people out already. So now they outside going crazy, you know what I mean? And everybody that's in there, you know what I mean? My, my oldest son was just a baby. He was just learning how to walk. My cousin was holding him, I remember. And I'm looking around, I'm looking for my mother because I'm like, man, this can't be real. I'm looking for my, where's my mama at? You know what I mean? That's the only person who I'm looking for to bring me back, you know what I mean? Bring me back to, you know what I mean, where I need to be. Like, man, I, I, I gotta have some comments and peace about myself because my mind is just distraught right now. So I'm looking around, I'm looking around. Where's my mama at? Where's my mama? And as I'm looking at her, I'm seeing all these faces of people that I'm unfamiliar with staring at me. And I'm looking like, and it's, it's registering in my mind like, some of these people is judging me. They really looking at me like I'm this person who was described in some of this testimony. I've never been that person, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm collecting these thoughts and so much is going on and Carl, he's just crying. Over something I didn't do? For, for something I didn't do? And they snatching him up and he really screaming, for something I didn't do? And I'm, I'm, I'm just stuck, like. And my reaction at that time was the same as his, but a different version. I just, I laughed out loud, you know what I'm saying, to myself out loud. I wasn't laughing at the situation or anything like that. I just, it was like, I felt like it was a dream I couldn't wake up from. You just didn't believe it was happening? No. And I'm like, I say, man, <laughs> no, no, man, this, <laughs> this can't be real. This, <laughs> these people are crazy, man, what, what is going on? Why do you think the jury convicted you? I believe more than anything, they was pressured. And who knows, I don't know, you know what I mean? If somebody was to meet those people now, interview them, maybe they might say what was going on. It could have been this many people or that many people, but obviously they had a, a long, hard thought about it. They had some time struggling with the decision because due to the 26 hours, you know what I mean? And maybe it could have been one person who said, I don't care, I just, you know, I'm not with y'all on this. So who knows, like, I try not to even, you know what I mean, think about that. So were you really angry at first when, you, when they eventually, you know, you ended up in the Toledo Correctional Institution? Were you, were you angry at that time? Were you having a hard time dealing with it? What were you, how were you emotionally? I mean, like I say, I'm here to be honest, so anger was one of my emotions. I'd be sitting here telling you a bold-faced lie if I told you I wasn't angry. But more than anything, I was hurt. Because, see, a lot of people that can read stuff in the newspaper or even see, see, you know what I mean, like this, or see a story, they don't know all the minute, specific details. You know what I mean? Like I said, at that time, I just had a son. My girlfriend at the time just lost another one of my sons and she was pregnant and had a miscarriage while I was in the county, Lucas County Jail awaiting my trial. And the thing for me and Carl, his son was born while we was in Lucas County. And in the community where we come from, it's unfortunate that on both ends, how people are affected by stuff like this and we all too familiar with it. So coming up my whole life, we didn't dream about maybe stuff that seemed typical or normal to a regular citizen that didn't come from where we come from. You might have dreamt of being, I mean, I don't know what you foresaw, saw, uh, foresaw yourself being if this was it or you had a few options, but our dream was to have a son because we wanted to raise somebody and groom somebody and teach them and instill morals in them and principles so that they would be better than us. So 
that would be our legacy. We would have somebody that come from where we came from to be able to say, I made it. So you were, you probably felt a lot of pain knowing that your son was going to be stuck with the legacy that his dad's a killer. Well, I wouldn't say that because that's not the truth anyway. So his legacy is he a young man. He's a high school graduate. He's planning to go to college. He's done way more than I ever did. I got to vary. You know what I mean? And that's one, you know what I mean? I had other sons too, you know what I mean? But from, you know what I mean, different, different, huh? What, what are your kids' names? I mean, I, I, I wouldn't even say because I, you know what I mean? I don't, I don't want them to be plagued anymore by this situation than they already have to be. But it's probably hurt you a lot, I'm guessing, that you obviously can't be there for them. Because like you said, that's all you really wanted. You wanted to have a kid and raise him up. Not, not just a kid, a son. Mm -hmm. Where we come from, you young and you black and you from the inner city, a lot of us don't make it. Mm -hmm. These people in here in the prison, a lot of them is my peers. I knew all my life from kindergarten. And they back and forth from prison or every so often I hear such and such die. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Who was my peer who I grew up with played on the playground with, went to school with, you know what I mean, ate lunch at with, you know what I mean? And they not around no more. What could your attorney have done differently, you think? Well, most importantly, I believe I went against my beliefs in letting, allowing somebody to convince me not to stand up and speak up for myself. Me, I can, me, myself, and I can definitely speak for Carl. I know absolutely without a doubt, that's one thing that we both would do differently. But I don't really like to say, speak on what ifs, you know what I mean? Because I do believe everything happened for a reason, you know what I mean? And I might be here and I'm in prison, but that's not the end of my story. This, this is not my destiny. You know what I mean? My life still has a purpose. And I believe I went through this so that I could help other people. Right. So when you're laying in your cot at night and you're, you're thinking about how your story is going to end, how's it going to end? Well, I mean. How do you want it to end? To just be honest with you, like, I don't think specifically on that. You know what I mean? The thing that I that I daydream about mostly is my children. And now they're adults. So I missed out on teaching them how to tie a loop in their shoe or how to ride their bike or how to read a Dr. Seuss book. You know what I mean? So I just hope that in the future I can begin to attempt to start constructing a bridge of communication between them, mm -hmm. between me and them, rather, you know what I mean? Right. Are you optimistic that you're going to get out one day? I have to be, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Because anything else, and I'm setting myself up for defeat. E although, even though, the reality is that many innocent people haven't been released. It's people that haven't made it to the other side. So how have, you, how have you changed in prison? What, what are you doing, I mean, to make yourself a better man? Well, first and foremost, I have disassociated myself with people who don't think like me. You know what I mean? Before, you know, when you come from a community, like how I stated, the inner city, you know, central Toledo, all you, a lot of people know is that community. So many of my peers never been nowhere else, outside the neighborhood or outside the city. So you tend to hold on tight to your bonds like that, even though, excuse me, you know, such and such, you know what I mean, your, your homeboys or even some of your family members, they're not living right. 
but you 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 were taught loyalty and brotherhood and things of that nature. So, you know what I mean? That can a lot of times be your downfall. And here I am a living testimony to that. Somebody who I gave my heart, you know what I mean? Gave my compassion to and just had the purest of feelings for him, just stepped on me over and over again. And even still to this day, I may even sound like a fool, but I'm never gonna hate somebody I love. When you love somebody, I mean, you and everybody that's gonna see this, that's watching know this. You never stop loving nobody. So you still love Travis? Yeah, I do. And it's, I mean, it's hard to say because he did a lot to me, you know what I mean? And when I say I love him, I love the spirit of the person who I once knew. I look past the deeds, you know, of him, but the spirit of the person, <laughs> excuse me, that, um, I bonded with <laughs> oh. the spirit of the person that I bonded with, you know what I mean, was he came to me, you know what I mean, just raw. Like, it wasn't about uh, fluffing up his image or, you know, keeping up appearances towards me. He just wanted to be around me, and I saw that. You know what I mean? He he. Whenever I got around him, he was just like, man, I'm, I'm with you, man. And he had a biggest smile on his face, like, this my guy. It's, it was like, when we was together, nothing else mattered. You know what I mean? Like, in a sense, like, we adopted each other. You know what I mean? Like, not, not as like, I'm a father and he the son, or he a father and I'm a son. We just was like kindred spirits, you know what I mean? just traveling and, and just, you know what I mean, linked up and we related and we bonded, you know what I mean? Do you see yourself reaching out to him anymore? I have and I've tried to and I still even wonder, you know what I mean, how, you know what I mean, things is going for him and, and how and where his life is at these days. I mean, I know a little something because I know some of his, his brothers, and two of them just recently left here, so. And I knew them from when I was free, you know what I mean? So they know me, and they would tell me, like, they've been in and out of jail, so they haven't, went, once he got released, they wasn't out there with him because he never returned back to our community. So they never was out there with him, but they spoke to him on the telephone a couple of times. And they just told me, like, you know, because I asked them, like, did, did he ever mention me? And they, they, they say, no, he never, we never really talked much. He just asked me how I was doing or whatever and what's going on and say he want to meet his nieces and nephews and stuff like that one day. You know what I mean? Um, hey, Dawn. Yes. I, I know where Travis is. Can I... Talk to him about that. Is there any problem with that? Do you mean the the main witness against him? Um, I mean, I know where he's living. I know how his life's going. I know this is this stuff. Something that he wants, information that he wants. Well, I'm saying I'm. I don't want to say anything. I'm not allowed to say. Am I allowed to tell him where he's living? I mean, I mean, I don't know specifically. I know where he's at. Okay. I know where he live at. Okay. Because he just got his own place. Oh, no, I didn't know that. <laughs> so, I mean, he, he just he had just said that it's the first time in his life he's ever had his own place, and he's happy about that. Right, the last that I knew, you know, his brother told me mm -hmm. that he was still living in the place where, uh, right. he said it's some, uh, like a... Uh, Halfway house. Yeah, sort of, but he said it's like some church organization that helped people or whatever, and then he said he was having situations with them and they was threatening to put him out. Right. So I guess that was inevitable. Yeah. That he would get his own place. Yeah. Uh, let's see if there's anything else. Um, oh, what, what, 
So you're going to have a parole hearing in May of 2022. What, what are your thoughts about that hearing? Well, I, like I say, man, certain stuff like that, you, you can't, you in here, you got to take it one day at a time, man. You got to go day for day. You can't, you, you can't put your, dispel too much of your energy on that, on focusing on one thing, because that could um, contribute, you know what I mean, to the, to the breaking down of your, right. of your mental state, you know what I mean? But what if they ask you, are you sorry for what you've done? I'm going to tell them honestly, I haven't done what, I, what they say I'm accused of doing, and it's nothing on this planet that's ever going to allow me to say anything other. But, but what if they say, well, we're never going to let you out until you say you're sorry for what you've done? Well, I can't say, you know what I mean, because... You know, I can't dictate, you know what I mean, or foretell the future. That's that's in God's hands, man. And the thing is, I can never be sorry for something from the from the perspective, you know what I mean, of being someone who hasn't done something that they're accused of, but I do feel sorrow, you know what I mean, for the family and stuff, like, you know what I mean? And I would like to say, like, if I'm able to, you know, I would like to send my condolences to the family, but I would like them to know that Wayne Brady and Carl Willis is not responsible for their loss. Yet, I can never sit here and say that I feel the pain that they do, you know what I mean? And I've lost many of family members, peers, since I've been here, but that doesn't amount. I can't sit and pretend and say I know what it's like to lose someone in, in, in that fashion. Even with all I've been through, I haven't been through that. And I pray that I don't ever, you know what I mean? And I'm not someone who's, you know, uh, very religious or anything like that, you know what I mean? I believe, like I say, everybody got a purpose. I believe it, that it's something greater than us. I believe everything happened for a reason. I don't put too much more into it than that. You know what I mean? Right. So I guess just a final thing. I'll just let you say whatever you want to say for 30 seconds. What do you want people to know about how Wayne Brady's doing, his thoughts? I mean, just anything you want to... Well, say. thankfully, I've been gifted with the ability to stay stable, you know what I mean, to maintain my stability through all of this. You know what I mean? And you know, as long as I'm above solid ground, and, and I say this and people trip off me, it's like a little rhyme. I say, as long as I'm above solid ground, I refuse to be broken down to the last compound. So I'm going to keep striving. And I want anybody, you know what I mean, who would like to reach out to me or who has questions about this because it don't make sense to anybody, I welcome them to contact me or, you know, if you open, you open to them contacting you to get information, you know what I mean? And I just want people to know, you know, even coming from the position that I'm in, to everybody that's out there going through whatever their life struggle is, you know, look at me, I'm in prison, but no matter where you at, never let them hold you back. Continue to strive for what you believe in and never stop. That's 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 my message. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank it. you, man. So I mean the Supreme Court had turned down the Ohio Supreme Court had turned down your final appeal for um, a new trial. So I mean what do you guys what is what's the thought where you might go from here? I mean, I have no idea at this point. That's something that I would have to discuss with my legal team. So they haven't we haven't got to that point yet because, you know, soon after that, yeah. I was told about um, the most recent story. They supposed to send me a copy, something that was in the blade. Mm -hmm. I haven't I haven't got a chance to read it yet. Let me ask you one more thing. Do you know Shandrea Rayford? I do now, but... Did you go to school with her? I was told that, but I don't have no memory of her. So when she said... 
that I overheard. So she was on the stand and she said, yeah, Travis and uh, Wayne were always together hanging out and I overheard you know, Wayne say that he was involved in this on some four-way phone call or somehow. Is that just crazy? <laughs> so, have you seen that affidavit that contradicts that, that says, you know, I don't know how much I'm allowed to say or that, or I even, even should speak on that, but Absolutely. then you know that, you know, that's not her final statement. Mm -hmm. And just to, to speak, you know what I mean, this is what I can say. She, um, since I've been here, she had Jay paid me before, you know, email. And I tried to get to a point where me and her could have a line of communication because, you know, obviously she has attempted to assist in doing the right thing and coming forward with information that you know what I mean, even she herself felt was vital to the, you know what I mean, to the circumstances that, you know, but I believe this, like, when you come from a place like Central Toledo, you not, you not um, custom to dealing with law enforcement beyond you know, what every, very little that you have to, you know what I mean? And due to a lot of things like, you know, that has happened between the law enforcement and community, people are not willing to just volunteer, you know what I mean, to put they self, to make they self a target. And what I mean by that is people, people, believe in a mind it's a stigma behind even if you doing the right thing with with helping the law enforcement you know what i mean that you're going to be looked at as you you a traitor to your community or whatever you know what i mean and not only that a lot of people are afraid to come forward with information that can help not even myself but other people due to the fact that they see if I can go to jail, you know what I mean, be arrested and convicted based on nothing, based on some hearsay from a person who admitted to doing wrong they self and then turn around and contradict their story and admit that they were wrong and they told false things. And even, you know, her herself, she end up going to jail just for knowing him. And that was whenever I first began talking to her through the Innocence Project, you know what I mean? They, I was able to uh, write a letter to them, you know, write, write a letter to her, address to her, to them, and they, they read it, you know what I mean, and looked over it and gave it forward to her. So that's how I began talking to her, and they had um, conferenced me in on a phone call with her before, you know what I mean? And she just said all along that I just, I'm, I'm not, you know what I mean, wanting to keep going in circles with this about something that I never had nothing to do with to begin with, and you know, my plea to her was, okay, I'm with you on that. We, we share that in common. We share in common that somebody who we both invested ourselves into, you know what I mean, who we believed in, betrayed themselves. And then as a result, a domino effect, people around them, you know what I mean, have been affected due to his choices and decisions. Even, even not having direct involvement with his crime and things like that. You know what I mean? I'm guilty of knowing him. Unfortunately, you know what I mean? And that shouldn't be something that's said, that should be able to be said about a person who, I say, you know, 
I bonded with this person and all that. To use that word to say, man, I'm guilty of knowing this man. You know what I mean? And I just wanted to say one other thing too, like you asked me about parole and stuff and you know what I mean? Or if I ever believe that I'm going to get out of here, right? And you know, I, I recently saw, you know, on TV, I don't know if you ever heard of Ricky Jackson from Cleveland. And you know what I mean? I believe he he's an inspiration to me, you know what I mean? And if, if I can keep that positive attitude that he had that I saw in that interview and never allow this to get me down, like I said, then I'm doing all right. Regardless to where my story ends up, you know what I mean, what's, what's going to be the final leg, as long as I'm at peace with myself, you know what I mean, and, and you know what I mean, I, I, I keep my peace of mind then. After everything else that's been taken from me, nobody can take that, you know what I mean?